Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. Okay, we're going to be putting back in in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, uh, looking at uh, the Arminian view uh, that the atonement of Jesus Christ uh, was given on behalf of every single person uh, who has and who will ever live. Uh, one of the key passages from this, we started with this last week and so we'll kind of review it a little bit, but in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist, uh, Jesus is coming down to be baptized and John says, the writer, the Apostle John, because there's two Johns going on here, but the Apostle John uh, writing the text and then John the Baptist will say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We know here that uh, the world is the term that uh, ultimately must be debated. In other words, what is the world? Does world mean every single person who has and who will ever live? Or is world used uh, and meant to be defined in a more exclusive context? Uh, the second verse, John 3.16, one of the more favorite uh, passages, probably known by every single person in here. Uh, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. Uh, the idea here is that God loved every single person in the world and as such He gave His only begotten Son that what? That only the elect who will believe... No, it says what? Whoever believes... Whoever believes. John 4.42 And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. 1 John 4.14 The Apostle John writes, We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the what? Savior of the the world. Romans 5 9, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. 1 Timothy 2 6, Paul writes, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Doesn't say some, it says he gave his life a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 4.10 For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Especially of believers. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. That's Titus 2.11. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Hebrews 2 9. But we do see him, speaking of Jesus Christ, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now it doesn't state here what appears to be so prevalent in the Reformed <coughs> position that Christ's death is only a benefit for some. Why? Because the writer to the Hebrew says that when he tasted death, it was an actual death he tasted, not a potential death, and that what he did, he did for everyone. And he himself is the propitiation, the satisfaction of payment uh, to avert God's wrath. He is himself the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours only, but also for those of the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2. 
Now this is the one where we left off last week, and I said in my opinion that this is probably the most difficult passage uh, in reference to dealing with uh, universal versus particular uh, redemption or limited atonement. In Peter, 2 Peter 2.1, Peter writes this, But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. As a matter of fact, this, it's, it's such a difficult passage that uh, Charles Ryrie, who was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, and he was, those of you who know Dr. Leaf, who come here in the past, he's kind of my theological mentor. Well, Dr. Ryrie was his theological mentor. Uh, and so uh, Harry's got a pretty good uh, line of sight on uh, Ryrie's theology. And if you pull up, those of you who have Ryrie's study Bible or look at his basic theology, uh, he uses one verse because he considers himself uh, what's called a four-point Calvinist, or what's sometimes referred to as a Christmas Calvinist, because in the TULIP acronym, he would believe in everything except Noel, right? Noel, Christmas Calvinist, and the L being limited atonement. And the reason he rejects limited atonement or particular redemption is because of this verse right here, Second Peter two one. Uh, he would hold to the view. Uh, based upon this passage here, that when Christ died upon the cross, uh, the payment of, of His death uh, paid for the sins of every single person without exception. Uh, and I wasn't necessarily going to deal with this particular passage here, but uh, this is kind of an overview of the subject. Uh, but I did want to, because this is the most difficult kind of deal with this, uh, for those of you who kind of are on the other side of the fence, you say, well, how would you deal with a passage like this because it seems to be so clear that when Christ died upon the cross, at least in this passage, He appears to be dying for people who were false teachers. Because after all, it says that He bought them. Right? Well, how do we deal with a passage like this? Well, remember that in Peter's um, epistle, he's writing primarily to Jews. Uh, and he borrows from the Old Testament, specifically, I think, from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses is talking to the children of Israel. And those of you who've either seen the movie The Ten Commandments or, you know, you like to sit down and read, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and uh, those Old Testament books like that, realize, or in Exodus, uh, that uh, when the children of Israel were in the desert, they completely followed God with absolutely no problems and no worries whatsoever, right? Yeah. Wrong. They didn't get it halfway out of Egypt before they began to murmur against God and murmur against Moses and reject Moses' leadership and reject God's leadership. And there were false prophets that rose up through the nation of Israel. And Moses is recounting this. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, he says, Do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is it not He, is not He your Father who has bought you? Oh, and once what sense did God buy the Israelites? Was there, was there some form of payment? Was there some form of, of redemption? Well, the answer is no. Uh, the term bought there comes from um, a Hebrew word which means to acquire. And in most cases, unless specifically redemption is stated in conjunction with the term to acquire, Bought just simply means bought, to acquire. Consider, for example, Genesis 4.1. Genesis 4.1, Eve says, Now the man had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And Eve said, I have gotten, that is, acquired a man-child with the help of the Lord. That's the same Hebrew word used for the term bought in the Deuteronomy passage. Did Eve have to buy her child? No. Did Eve have to commit some great sacrifice to acquire the child? No. She simply acquired the child. So it's 
more often than not, unless it's specifically driven by the context of a passage, acquire simply means to acquire, to obtain. Now, what we have to ask ourselves, in the 2 Peter 2, 1 passage, does the word agorazo, which means to purchase or to buy, support the claim that what is going on there is universal atonement? That is, that Christ died for every single person without exception. Well, consider this. Agorazo was used 30 times in the New Testament, meaning to acquire or to obtain something for oneself. When used in the context of salvation, it's used five times in the New Testament. Either explicitly stated or implicitly that is implied. And in each of those cases, the purchase price is either explicitly or implicitly stated. The purchase price. Where it's not in the Second Peter 2 one passage. Uh, I know you may not be able to see this, but I'll read it to you. Uh, the first one, for example, 1 Corinthians 6.19, Paul writing to the church, so he's writing to believers. He says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple, the naos of the Holy Spirit, that is, the Holy of Holies? He's not talking about the entire temple area. He's talking about the holiest of holies in which the priest could only go into once a year on the Day of Atonement. He's saying that was where, the, if you wanted to get closest to God, that's where you had to go, the Holy of Holies. And what Paul is stating now is that based upon uh, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because of uh, His death, burial, and resurrection, God the Holy Spirit now resides within us so that our body becomes the naos of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, Paul says, for you have been bought. Bought with what? Bought with a price. So in the context there, he specifically states that you have been bought, but you've been bought with a price. And within the context there, uh, the, the purchase price uh, being the shed blood of the Lord Jesus to make you a believer or a Christian or to put you in the family of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves to men. Another context or another verse in which it's used, Agorazo, and they sang a new song, Revelation 5, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased, there's our term agorazo, you were purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. The context there is clearly uh, salvation. Uh, Revelation 14.3, And they, and he's speaking about Christians who have been redeemed, sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Again, the context there being something still future to us, but he's talking about those individuals who have been redeemed. Clearly, um, these are Christians. Uh, and in Revelation 14.4, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These, that is, these redeemed Christians, have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Uh, one writer, this is the... <clears throat> he actually wrote a, a very good article. It's on the uh, Internet. Uh, if you go to Google and type in 2 Peter 2.1, um, and then type in universal right after that his paper will come up it's a real good exegetical paper uh, he's uh, he says this in regards to this uh, dilemma he says after all the exegetical considerations that means after you go back through and look at everything that's written in the Greek text and you compare it with everything else because that's how we do proper Bible study right uh, he says after you do all that work considerations have been observed. It would appear that the only people that can appeal to the text exegetically and contextually are those who understand it non-redemptively or those historic Arminians who believe you can lose your salvation. What he's talking about there is if you look at 2 Peter 2.1, the only way that you can look at it is to look at it from the perspective that it is in reference to God the Father, not the Son, but is in reference to God the Father and that the acquiring of the false teachers has to do with God as sovereign creator rather than Jesus Christ as mediator. 
And I think when we go back to 2 Peter, uh, and, and if you read that, you'll see that that is in fact the case. So you can hold the view if you look at 2 Peter like that, or if you hold to the view that you can lose your salvation. Because what's happening in the text is that you have Christ buying people who were unbelievers or people who were initially believers and lose their salvation and ultimately leave the church. Those are the only two options in order to remain and be consistent. He says, those who believe in eternal security, whether reformed or non-reformed, may not nor cannot appeal to this text with a redemptive sense. So what he's saying is that the Second Peter 2 1 doesn't have anything to do really with salvation in a redemptive sense. He's talking about God the Father who acquired these false teachers, just like God the Father who acquired the false prophets in the Old Testament economy that were part and parcel of the nation of Israel. So God the Father has acquired these false teachers who will come into the church as part and parcel of um, the they're being affiliated or associated with the church. And in every case, if we go back and look at all of these verses, in every case where purchase or agorazo is used in reference to bought or acquiring something, if it's talking about salvation, that Christ bought their salvation, it will always have the believer in context. 2 Peter 2.1 does not. 2 Peter 2.1 does not. So, for me, that's why as good a passage as 2 Peter 2.1 is in reference to support universal atonement because it is not consistent with the other five times that it's mentioned uh, there in the text. Um, that would, that's one of the reasons why it's good, but it doesn't quite answer everything else that these other passages have. So, if you still say, well, it's close enough for me, I, I think I, I'll believe that, and still hang on to universal atonement, that'll be up for you to defend uh, if you're questioned on that. But just to let you know, that's one reason why I don't think, uh, in my opinion, that he's dealing with salvation. Um, another passage that uh, universal atonement folks like to use is 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing that any perish, but for all to come to repentance. But for all to come to repentance. Not just some, or not just the elect, but every person. And also in 1 Timothy 2, Paul writes, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So in summary... If I've lost you on those going through those passages and verses, let's forget that for a second and we'll just kind of summarize everything. The provision of Christ's atonement is for everyone. That's what that position advances, the Arminian position. It is sufficient for everyone to be saved, but man must take hold of it and accept it. Amen. Man must take hold of it and accept it. Thus, Arminianism limits the application of the atonement in that the sinner must choose to appropriate its benefits in order to have it energized in his life and become effectual. Okay? Anyone have any questions on this one? If you know these two, you've got this whole system down. If you know these two. Now, are there any potential problems with this view of the atonement? What are the potential problems with this view? Put man in uh, <coughs> puts man accountable for his own salvation in a sense. To me, it put man it puts man accountable for his own salvation in some sense. Anyone disagree with that? Yes. How, how is that not the case? You cannot pay for the sins. Of his own sins, only Christ can save him. Right. Well, I think he would agree with that. The response is, uh, or the initial response is, uh, it puts man as being the determiner of his salvation. However, the objection to that would be, yeah, but man cannot pay with his. There's nothing inherently valuable in man that can equal that which was offended, namely God's holiness. For Paul even says. 
that the wages of sin is death and the soul that sins will surely die. And therefore, there's nothing inherent within man that can equal that payment that needed to be paid. Yes, sir? Well, in the Armenian scheme of that, that's correct. Uh, the objection being, well, uh, if uh, Christ said that none can snatch them out of my hand, the Father's given them to me. Uh, we'll look at that verse here in a little bit when we discuss that. Um, but if that's the case, in other words, if man can take hold of his salvation, then he's free to at some point reject that salvation. Uh, and Armenians do hold that view. Uh, they say that at some point uh, one can choose to reject Christ and repudiate the faith and thereby go out into the world again. As a matter of fact, that's the argument there uh, that Peter uses regarding these false teachers that Christ did in fact did buy them um, and they're out here teaching heretical doctrines. And then John even says in 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. So... So my point was to total depravity, that man is totally inadequate to come to Christ, period. It must be the Holy Spirit that draws a man to himself. Without that, you know, we're totally deprived. We, mm -hmm. The lost man cannot know the things of the Spirit, period. There's no way that a lost man can, within himself, come to God. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. don't believe it. Yeah. And, and that's the, uh, uh, the appeal being to the argument of the total depravity of man. Uh, if, for the sake of argument, we leave this proposition up here and we begin to examine this proposition, that what? That the provision of Christ's atonement is for everyone. That is, it is sufficient for everyone to be saved, but now we introduce a necessary condition. And what is that necessary condition? That one must accept or take hold of it. And the argument is, is that if man is truly as bad off as what the Bible says that he is, how can man in and of himself do this? How can a spiritually dead man believe? So it is an objection uh, for sure that the Armenians have to reconcile. And they do uh, by way of prevenient grace as we discussed last week. Well, some of that is exactly what uh, MacArthur has suggested um, in his estimation of the Armenian view, he says this, uh, the biggest problem of what we find in the Armenian view of the atonement is that it is the sinner who ultimately limits the work of the atonement. In that, Christ's work is only a possible atonement, but not an actual atonement. It does not actually save anyone. It only makes it possible that people can be saved because the precondition to have the atonement energized and reconciled to one's account is what? Belief. So, the atonement is there in the Armenian schema. But MacArthur is absolutely right in the sense, and it is a difficult thing to surmount, is that the atonement of Christ is ultimately hindered uh, by, by man and his choices. Well, let's consider the other side of the coin. Because the other side of the coin has problems too. <laughs> In the Calvinistic schema, or the view of the atonement, um, Calvinism affirms that the imputation of sin and that all men are guilty of Adam's sin, that is, by way of imputed and inherited sin, Man is a confirmed sinner in Adam, which is why he commits personal sins. Man does not become a sinner after he sins. So you take a little baby who comes into this world, and once they become a toddler, you know, the terrible twos or the tricky threes, and they get up around that age and they begin to exhibit uh, human depravity, uh, we know that eventually they will sin. Um, it's not after they commit a personal sin that they become guilty in the eyes of God. They sin because they come into this world sinners. They sin because they come into this world sinners. 
as such, the provision of Christ's death then is only for those whom the Father selected. Ultimately, these are the individuals who will comprise the church. That's you. It is sufficient for everyone, but its intent is only for His people. Referred to in the text over 50 times in some version uh, of the term elect, or the called, or the church. When you say church, when the word is ecclesia, the word comes from uh, kaleo, which is to call, and ek, to call out from, to call out from the world. We are the ones who have been called out from the world. We are the elect. And so this system teaches that believers cannot lose their salvation. Why? Because their salvation is brought about and sustained by Christ. The redemptive merits of the atonement are accomplished at the cross, but applied to the individual in time when they are effectually called by God through the gospel. Even the faith used to appropriate the salvation, even that is a gift from God. We'll see when we get to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, we'll discuss that a little bit more. <laughs> now consider some of the passages that they use. Because remember, the Arminians use terms like all, whole world, everyone. There are passages in the New Testament that appear to give credence to this system's view. Uh, Revelation 5, 9, And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. You were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So he's not saying, that is John the Revelator, is not saying here uh, every single person without exception. What he's talking about are people without distinction. So it's not every single person. It is men, that is people, from every tribe, every tongue, every people, and every nation. Matthew one twenty one. The angel says, And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Not he will save every single person from his sin. John chapter 10, Jesus speaking to the disciples says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. In the context here, he's speaking, now this is before the, the crucifixion. Uh, and so the context of Jesus using this um, um, illustration of a shepherd and sheep, he's talking to the children of Israel who are his sheep. That's in context to who he's speaking to. But he mentions sheep who are not of this fold. Who would that be? Gentiles, Gentiles right? Because Paul's going to get into that when we get into Ephesians chapter 3, that, that God's master plan has always been Jew and Gentile in one body comprising the, uh, the, this entity called uh, the church. Uh, but back to what Jesus is saying. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. Jesus answered and told them, I told you and you do not believe. Now, a little bit further down from that passage we just read, he's going to get into it with the religious leaders. And they're going to ask him a question. Look, if you're Messiah, why don't you just come right out and tell us? You know, why do you keep beating around the bush? You're telling stories and you're doing all these other things. If you're the guy, then just tell us. I'm the guy. And Jesus answered and said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. You see, that's the total depravity aspect that we were talking about previously. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, because you don't believe, you're not my sheep, which is what we would think that he would say. But he says, you do not believe. Why? Because you are not 
of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Getting back to what Paul said earlier. And why is that? Because my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Beloved, that's the doctrine of eternal security right there. Once a person is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, they cannot lose their salvation. We'll see once we get into really looking at this doctrine of the church, uh, as we move a little bit further along in the book of Ephesians, we'll come to realize that you and I are trophies. You know, How many competitors do we have in here? People who like to compete, win trophies, medals... You know, that's it? There's only three of you guys in here? Okay. Now how many there you go. How many of you guys how many of you guys in here have like a trophy or something? Something you're really proud of, you know, you keep up on your wall, you know, whether it be golf or volleyball or, or whatever, right? <laughs> we like to do those things because we like to show those things off. When we see those trophies What those trophies say is that you, as a person who got the trophy, but there's something, there's a quality that you have that demonstrates to everyone else who sees the trophy that the trophy points to you because there's something in you that deserves the trophy. Is that not the case whenever time we see the trophy? Certainly. Beloved, you and I are trophies. You and I are trophies that the Lord Jesus Christ acquired so that when one day in heaven, and Paul will get into using this this illustration, but one day in heaven, we're going to ask perhaps just how, how much grace does God demonstrate? How much grace does God have? And you know what he's going to say? He's going to say, I want you to go down to the library and I want you to pull up the file of the life of Jim over there. You want to see grace? Go look and see how I used him to go to the jailhouses, to see how many people were brought to Christ, to how I changed his own life. You want to know what grace is? Go watch that. And you'll see the power of God's grace. Jim is a trophy of God's grace as am I and every other believer in here. We cannot lose our salvation because it was never ours to try to obtain. Yes, ma'am. In a sermon in my past somewhere, if you truly believe, I'm not just saying if you're a Christian, if you truly believe, you cannot lose your salvation. <laughs> there are many that come and say that they believe, but mm-hmm. they really don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, well, that's a whole different matter there. Yeah. But what she's saying is, but what about people who, uh, you know, like, like the false teachers, for example, people who come in and associate with the church because you know, uh, th- there's not there's not a DNA test, if you will, or a CAT scan that we put uh, like a metal detector at the front door that tells us who a real Christian is versus who is not. So it is possible there are people who are unbelievers. Uh, that come into the church and to identify, receive the blessings of God because of their affiliation with the church, but who may not be believers at all. Uh, that's true, but that's not that's out that's outside the context specifically of what we're referring to uh, here. Are there people who are professors of faith but not true possessors of faith? Most certainly, and they're in every church. Yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, I would say that that has a lot to do with uh, the problem of people because if you go back and look at the at the way evangelism was conducted in the New Testament, uh, generally speaking, and I think Paul is an excellent example of this. If you go look at his sermon in Acts chapter 17 and look at his sermons uh, throughout, actually, the book of Acts about how he came to faith, uh, one of the paradigms that he always sets up is the goodness of God, the righteousness of God as revealed through the law, and our inability to obtain or be viewed as righteous. 
And then Paul introduces the Gospel and in many cases he uses himself as the example. I was doing this and I did this and then I met the Lord Jesus and you know He saved my soul and now I'm out building churches and so on. So yes, I would say that that's definitely the case uh, because a lot of times in churches we're unclear. Uh, again, I think it goes back a lot to a person's theology uh, that we become unclear as to, in fact, what must one do to be saved. A lot of times we say, well, walk down an aisle and fill out this card and so forth. Uh, when salvation is appropriated by putting one's faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And that's it. Um, but a lot of times it can cause confusion when people are not clear on what, what one must do to be saved. Now, consider what Jesus is saying over here in John. He says... Um, in regards to his his uh, teaching there, those said to be his sheep, according to John ten fourteen, are those that he knows. He gave his life for them. He gives eternal life to them, and those whom he gives eternal life are said to be those that are given to him by the Father. These sheep hear his voice; they follow him. And many of those listening to him are said not to be his sheep. So there's a, a contrast, if you will, in those who are listening to his sermon. Further, and we just said this, those who are not, that do not believe in him are because they are not of his sheep and not the other way around. You know, I'm looking at the clock back there. I thought we would be done with this for sure because there's still a few more passages. Uh, but I don't want to wear anyone out. Maybe, maybe you guys are getting a little hungry or something. But is there any questions? We'll go one last Sunday to finish this up um, to kind of look at some of this. But yes, ma'am. Don't a lot of people prefer to believe in the universal atonement because our innate pride prevents us from believing Do a lot of people uh, uh, believe in universal atonement because it's they think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and, and and that's true. Um, but when people bring up an objection against the fundamental fairness of God, what they fail to do is take into consideration. Because I've heard people say, "Well, that's not fair. Why doesn't God be fair? Uh, if God were to be fair, no one would be saved. Every single person would be uh, going to eternal judgment." Yes, ma'am. Right. No, that's true. Uh, if we go back and look at the judgment passages in Revelation chapter 20, uh, and I'll tell you that this is one of the, this is another thing, and, and we'll leave it here. But one of the biggest things for me personally in regards to universal atonement is the fact that so many people, um, if you hold to the view of universal atonement, you, you have to believe that what Christ did, number one, He did for everyone. That it's across the board. Secondly, that what he did was an actual payment. Third, in the universal schema, they would say that, well, but a person must still appropriate it. Well, scripture makes it clear. God's commanding everyone everywhere to repent, to believe. Is failing to believe a sin? Yes. Well, when Christ died upon the cross, didn't he die for that sin? Well, now some Armenians will say, well, he died for every sin but the sin of unbelief. But when we get to Revelation chapter 20, beloved, and we start looking at, and the books were opened, and the dead were judged according to the things written in the book, well, then we come to find out that if Christ had even paid for those sins, then what are in the world are they being having to pay for them as well? You see, that introduces double jeopardy. So there's a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, but I'm not saying that to tell you that, well, the other system by default is, is the correct view. Uh, these are hard things to swallow and these are hard doctrines to try to wrap our puny minds around. And I said last week that when we came back this week that we would offer up a view that I think would be palatable, I think, to both sides. But unfortunately, because of time, we'll have to wait. And then next week, hopefully, we'll be able to reconcile this great dilemma of God's sovereignty, human responsibility, and the lostness of man. Well, let's pray.
Lord, thank you for our time together this morning. We, uh, we realize, Father, that these are difficult doctrines to understand. We, we just thank you that uh, you've given great uh, uh, men and women of the church who have in the past uh, thought about these issues, have uh, wrestled with them, have preserved them in their writings and allowed us to study them along with uh, the final authority on the subject, uh, your word. And Lord, we just uh, thank you for just the oppor opportunity to be able to, to ponder these things together. And we pray, Father, that it uh, not be something that's divisive, but rather that it's iron which sharpens iron, that we grow stronger in our belief and stronger in our convictions, that no matter what may oppose the truth of the word of God, that we stand ready to defend it and to believe it at all costs. And we just thank you, and we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.